I've been asked to talk a little bit about what went on in Asbury recently. Please share your thoughts on the Asbury Revival USA and or on biblical and historical revival in general. And before I do, I've got two precursors to this whole message. Number one is that I did not personally attend Asbury and have no firsthand experience of what actually happened there. I've only got a general idea of things that I was seeing on Twitter and a lot of that was secondhand experience or hearsay as well. So I don't claim to be an expert on those particular events and apologies therefore if I say anything which mischaracterizes what actually took place. And then secondly, I believe the events at Asprey are now actually finished. Everyone's packed up and gone home, I believe. So with those two things in mind, I'm gonna speak about revival in a more general sense and then maybe we can relate it back to Asprey and we can make sense of those events if we so choose. And to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, and I'm going to highlight the passages in the Bible where it talks about the Holy Spirit moving in power, whether that be resting upon someone, filling someone, or just moving, showing up in some extraordinary way. Now, as I read these passages, what I want us to do is see if we can spot a recurring pattern or theme emerging here. It's a lot of verses. It'll take quite a while to read them all out, but I think the sheer amount of verses should just reinforce and add weight to the point I'm trying to make. So as I read all of these verses about the Holy Spirit showing up, resting on someone, moving in power, let's see if we can spot the recurring pattern. I think it will reveal itself pretty obviously quite early on. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again. Two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet the spirit rested upon them as well. So they prophesied there in the camp. Balaam saw the people of Israel camped tribe by tribe. Then the spirit of God came upon him. And this is the message he delivered. At that time, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, they saw a group of prophets coming toward them. Then the spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul and he too began to prophesy. The spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also began to prophesy. But on the way to Naoth and Ramah, the spirit of God came even upon Saul and he too began to prophesy all the way to Naoth. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. Then the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, this is what God says. You sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and he told me to say, this is what the Lord says to the people of Israel. Then after doing all those things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. But as for me, I am filled with power with the Spirit Spirit of the Lord, I am filled with justice and strength to boldly declare Israel's sin and rebellion. And now if we get into the New Testament, look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, who will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Now, after the Holy Spirit came upon those in the upper room at Pentecost, watch what Peter immediately does. He goes out to preach 
to the crowds. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. Then he goes on to preach the gospel message to that crowd. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other languages, in other tongues, and prophesied. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshipping in the Spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches. It's pretty noticeable that whenever the Holy Spirit is moving in power or resting upon someone in the Bible, there is this urge, this compulsion to speak out God's truth to the world, to proclaim, to prophesy, to announce God's truth to the world. We see that in the Bible over and over and over, Old and New Testament. Now, this makes sense because the Holy Spirit, after all, is the spirit of truth, whose primary job it is to testify and to witness to the world about God's truth and to guide us towards that truth. Jesus called the Holy Spirit his advocate. He says, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. So when that spirit comes upon someone, the spirit whose job it is to testify and witness and be an advocate for Jesus, when that spirit comes upon someone, there's this natural urge within us to speak this out, to be a witness and an advocate and to testify about Jesus in the world. This is why blaspheming the spirit, by the way, is the unforgivable sin, because the spirit is witnessing to us the truth about God and his son. But if we reject that witness, we're calling him a liar. And that's what it means to blaspheme the Spirit. Everyone who rejects Jesus as Lord and Savior is blaspheming the Spirit, calling him a liar. But anyway, that's a whole other tangent. Whenever the Spirit is truly moving, it will cause this empowerment, this emboldening, this strengthening to go out and to speak out. And then the idea is that as we go out, the Spirit will then empower us with signs and wonders following us wherever we go. Because as we serve the Lord and are obedient to the Lord, the Spirit will then equip us for that task, even giving us the words to speak as we need them. Sometimes we get ourselves into difficult situations. We don't know what to say. The Spirit will intervene and give us the words to say. So look at Pentecost, which is especially instructive, actually, because that's the first expression of the Spirit's move within the church under the new covenant. So what happens? What does the Spirit compel the church to do? Well, the Holy Spirit comes upon them in the upper room and they have that experience, but then immediately they are compelled to go out and to proclaim the gospel to the crowds, to fulfill the Great Commission. And indeed, they fan out across the whole world, and that's why Christianity became such a powerful movement. Now, for this reason, whenever there's a claim of revival or a move of the Spirit, my first instinct is always, is it causing the people in that building to go out? and to speak out. That's what I was looking for in Asbury. That's what I think would indicate a true revival. That's what has historically been the marker in great revivals of the past as well, that it doesn't stay within the four walls. It can start there, but it doesn't finish there. It goes out and it changes the community. There's a wider saving work that happens in the world. I don't have a problem if it begins with a worship service or an event within four walls. Pentecost started within a small room. I don't have a problem if that event is emotional as well, as some do. A lot of people said that Asprey was too emotional. But I think when you encounter the living God and you're convicted of sin, emotion is a normal, natural response. I don't mind that at all. But I think the marker of a true move of God or a revival, if you will, is that it doesn't stay as a merely emotional worship event. It converts into outward focused action. And that's kind of what I'm waiting to see with Asbury. My response is, what is the fruit going to be? Are we now gonna see the people who were there fanning out across Kentucky and North America, emboldened to change lives and getting themselves into all kinds of trouble with the world because they're being countercultural and they're speaking up and they're wholeheartedly following the Spirit's call? I would love to see that, and I hope it's that, but at this moment, I just don't know. I guess let's see. 
I've often spoken about how good the church is at the safe and comfortable things. The church is really good at worship events. If you ask the church today to come to worship events and conferences and to sing and sit in rooms and study and take notes and have fellowship and drink tea and coffee with one another, they will do that. They'll do that all day long. So an extended elongated version of those things isn't necessarily a sign of revival. It could be, and those are all good things, but it's not necessarily a sign of revival. It all comes down to the long-term fruit. What happens after all that has died down? Is there long-term change? Has that emotion converted into permanent action? Has it produced a boldness to go out and speak out? That's when you're able to gauge what actually happened at events like Asprey. So let's see what the long-term fruit of it is. I genuinely really hope that we see something, but at this point, I just, I don't know, but that's what to look for. The Bible shows us that when the Holy Spirit moves, people speak out and proclaim and testify. And that's just the core principle of revival that I wanted to share in this video because I don't hear anyone really talking about that, but I think it's just a very provable thing from the Old and New Testaments. When the Spirit comes, people speak out and they're emboldened to do so. I'm going to make another video on this because I've got some more things to share and I've got some more personal experiences with things like this. So we're going to carry this on into a second video, I think. Um, but that's the core principle that I just wanted to share in this one.